Okay, we're in Colossians chapter 3. And this message I call, Seeking the Things from Above. Okay, we're starting in chapter 3. I'm going to say a quick prayer. Father God, thank you for your living word that divides the bone and the marrow, the spirit and the soul, and discerns the thoughts of our hearts. You're the only one, Lord, that knows our true heart. So we don't have the right to judge anyone because only you know someone's heart. I pray you'd speak to people out here through your living word, and then we leave here a little better than we came. Because we'll never be sinless until we get there to heaven, but we can sin less every day because of the power you give us by your spirit. And I pray in Jesus' name you bless everyone here. Okay, verse 1 in Colossians 3. Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Keep thinking about things above, not on things of the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. This idea of keeping our minds on the heavenly instead of down here on earth may sound like a waste of time to some people out here. And you have all probably heard the saying, well, he's so heavenly minded that he's no earthly good, right? He's walking in the clouds. What good is he here on earth? This is probably why Paul starts by saying, if you have been raised with Christ before he said it. This means you've been born again into the family of God by trusting in his resurrection from his death on the cross and actually following his teachings for any of this to make sense. And I'm going to give a scripture that supports that. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Amen? You see, uh, we have to humble ourselves and realize there's a higher power than ourselves and a higher standard of living and morality than what we can do ourselves. This allows for God to work in us and through us. And the brother of Jesus has something to say about this in his book, James. Chapter 4, verse 6 in James, it says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. We put a wall between us and our understanding of God if we don't humble ourselves before God and let him take care of our sin by the blood of his only son, Jesus. So if you really desire a true relationship with God and want this message to make much more sense, just accept now the offer of his son's blood for your sins and receive salvation. We can even find the gospel which is in which is the how and why of getting saved or becoming born again in the Old Testament. Like I said, we're going to do a little Easter segment here in Isaiah chapter 53. I'm going to read that to you. If anyone, if this Isaiah passage in the Old Testament, which has the gospel in it, you can get saved through the Old Testament too. It's got the gospel. Um, we'll, go get, we'll give you a chance in the middle of my message to get saved so it makes more sense. Okay, Isaiah 53. Now before I read this, I just want to tell you, um, you know, Pastor Chuck Smith, bless his heart, he died a couple years back in 2010, I believe it was. Uh, the guy that's, his son-in-law is now, is now head pastor, and he was in Israel with a group of people from church. He took them to Israel, and while they were on their tour, they had a Jewish tour guide. And he, uh, Pastor Brian read, a, read some verses out of chapter, Isaiah 53, and the man um, thought they were reading the New Testament. It describes Jesus' death so accurately, he swore that it was the New Testament, and he was blown away when Brian told him, this is out of your Torah. This is out of the Jewish Old Testament that I'm reading. So a lot of times they, they don't focus on that because it's got Jesus in black and white, easy to understand in it. And I'm going to go ahead and start by reading Isaiah chapter 53. It's got the gospel in it. Why, how we're saved by Christ's death on the cross. Okay, Isaiah 53, verse 1. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected. A man of sorrow was acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were punished from, from God. A punishment for his sins. 
But he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led to the, like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before shearers, he did not even open his mouth. Verse 8. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave, but it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. That means us. If we accept his offering for sin, it says right here, that's the gospel. We, he will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. That's us. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. You hear that? Because of what he did on the cross, my righteous servant Jesus will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. That's why he gave his life, so we could be seen as righteous. For he will bear all our sins. Verse 12, it says, I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. Well, we're the rebels. That's the gospel in the Old Testament. Even if we didn't have the New Testament, we could read that and know that through Jesus' death on the cross, we could be saved. So if anyone wants to understand this message better, you can give your life to the Lord right now. I'm going to go ahead and say a prayer. Just follow with me. And I'll give you a chance at the end, too. If God isn't quite speaking to you yet, you can have another chance at the end. Father God, thank you, Lord, that it's going to be Easter. Your resurrection is going to be celebrated. We can also celebrate our resurrection in you. If we just accept what you did on the cross, paying for our sin, you'll resurrect us too. Now and at the last day, we'll be seated at the right hand of the Father with you in heaven. We'll have our citizenship in heaven. We thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross. And, and I pray that everyone here that hears this is saved. And if not, that they would give their lives to you, either now or at the end of my message. And we thank you, Jesus. And we ask you to continue speaking through us, to us through your living word, Lord. Verse 4 of Colossians 3. It says, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you too will be revealed in glory with Him. Just like Jesus was clothed with God's glory before He ascended to His Father in heaven, we are also promised to be clothed with God's glory as well before we come face to face with God, or we would be instantly vaporized by the power of His great glory. Okay, remember Moses, if anyone's seen the Ten Commandments, he, Moses wanted to see God directly and was told that no man could survive it. And he was permitted to basically see God's shadow pass by the cleft in the rock. And after God passed by, Moses had to wear a face covering so people would not see the afterglow from being in God's presence. I'm going to read that verse to you. Exodus 33:17. It says, The Lord replied to Moses, I will indeed do what you have asked, for I look favorably on you, and I know you by name. Moses responded, then show me your glorious presence. You see, Moses didn't know what he was asking. He would have killed him if God showed him his presence. Verse 19, the Lord replied, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will call out my name Yahweh, which also can be translated Jehovah, or my favorite, I Am. Because the former two are just good guesses at best. Before you. The reason I like I Am is because God is. He never had a beginning, nor will he ever end, because he is eternal. And most people, even if they have not read the Bible, have seen the movie The Ten Commandments, right? Where Moses asked God, who appeared in the burning bush, what is your name? And God says, my name is I Am. For I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. But you may not look directly at my face, for no one may see me and live. The Lord continued, look. Stand near me on this rock. As my glorious presence passes by, I will hide you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will remove my hand and let you see me from behind. But my face will not be seen. 1 Corinthians 15.53 it says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. 
For this corruptible must also put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So since we will be glorified with an eternal body, we can see God face to face then. And we will know God even as He knows us. Amen? What a glorious promise. So what do we do with this knowledge? And how are we to live our lives while we're waiting for Jesus to return? The following verses will tell us. Verse 5, Colossians 3, says, So put to death whatever in your nature belongs to the earth. Sexual immorality, put that to death. Impurity, put that to death. Shameful passion, put away your evil desires. Put away your greed, which is idolatry. Verse 6, Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. So you want to be right with God now. You don't want to wait and be called the sons of disobedience because that's what he's going to pour out his anger on soon on the earth. You also lived your lives in this way at one time when you used to live among them. That's if you're saved. He's talking to you if you're saved. But now, put up all things such as anger, put away rage, put away malice, slander, abusive language from your mouth. Verse 9. Do not lie to one another since you put off the old man with his practices and have been clothed with the new man that is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of the one who created it. That would be Jesus. Amen. It also says something like that in 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Amen. I love that verse. Uh, verse 11, Colossians 3. Here, there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised. There's no barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all in all. So if we're in Christ, it doesn't matter what color you are, it doesn't matter where you came from, it don't matter how dirty you are, how sinful you are, we're all the same if we're in Christ. Amen? We're brothers and sisters. So it's not what we are born as that matters to God, because He'll give us a new birth. He'll give anyone a new birth abiding in His Son Jesus by drinking, by faith, the living water of His Word that can transform us and believing in His work for us on the cross to pay for our sins. Amen. Amen. Now it moves on to the next part of the chapter. Exhortation to unity and love. So after God gives us this new heart, we gain the ability to take on some of the godly characteristics of God's Son, Christ. And this is called putting on the new man. Ephesians 4.22, it says, that you put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, so we don't talk the way we used to talk, do we? Which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. Verse 23, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which is after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. I remember when profanity was almost in every sentence I used before, I, before uh, God took out my heart of stone and gave me a new heart. If He didn't give me a new heart, I wouldn't be here today doing this, using my Saturday to bless others. None of us would be here if He didn't give us a new heart. All we would have cared about is ourselves and partying on the weekend. But no, not anymore. We wanted to come bless others now. That gives us more joy than getting high or partying or whatever. And this concept is not just found in the New Testament. Just like before, I read you the Gospel in Isaiah, right? The Old Testament. Being come born again is also in the Old Testament. Uh, in Ezekiel 11:19, it says, this is the Old Testament, and I will give them one heart. I will put a new spirit within you. So God says He'll change your spirit. He'll put a spirit, a new spirit in you. He'll take away the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh. So He'll take out the stone, He'll put in a heart of His, a heart of love, a heart of flesh. Jesus said we will recognize other believers by their fruit or by the change in priorities and the reasons why and what people are doing now compared with the things that they used to do. He'll make you a little better, right? No one's going to be perfect, but we'll get better each day if we fellowship and stay in God's Word. Matthew 7, 18, it says, A good tree cannot, cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Verse 19, Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruit shall to know them. So we'll know other believers. We see the way they used to be. We see what the new things God think, you know, puts their interest on. Things of the Lord, blessing other people, being having love, and not talking the way they used to. Every other word's the F word, right? All of us are at a different place in God with that. 
You know, sometimes it takes people more time to change. Other people change right away. God is different in everyone. But we're all getting changed for the better if we're seeking Him. So if somebody's been claiming to be part of the family of God, but has no problem doing evil things that they used to do, you need to pray that God will reveal this to them. And try to stay clear of them so God can restore them back, so God can work in them. If they were ever truly given a new heart, God will work in them, bring them back into the family of God. The following verses are what we should be seeing in a child of God's life after God puts on the new man or woman for them. After he changes their heart, these are the things you'll see in someone's life. Colossians 3 verse 12, it says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with a heart of mercy. See, he'd give us a heart of mercy. Kindness. You'll see some kindness in someone. Humility. You'll see people being gentle and patient. Verse 13. Bearing with another. Forgiving one another. So you help someone go through the problems they're going with, right? You forgive them. If someone happens to have a complaint against anyone else. Just the Lord, as the Lord forgave you, you also forgive others. You forgive them. Verse 14. And do all these virtue, virtues add love, which is the perfect bond. Verse 15. Let the peace of Christ be in control of your heart. For you were in fact called as one body to this peace. You can't have peace if you don't have God, right? That's what gives you peace. Remember it said, I read in Isaiah 53, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. So if he wasn't chastised, we couldn't have peace. Because we couldn't be restored to God through without his son. Without his son's sacrifice. And be thankful, it says. Verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and exhorting one another with all wisdom, singing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs, all with grace in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Now it says, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord, and husbands, love your wives, and do not be embittered against them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this is pleasing in the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, so they will not become disheartened. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in every respect, not only when they're watching. Now that was back then, now it's at our job, right? We want to do this unto the Lord, because God's watching. We're not doing it because our boss is watching, even though I'm sure we're going to step up our step right if our boss is watching us. But God expects us to do that even if our boss is not there. Do it as unto the Lord. That's what it means here. Okay, it says, Slaves, I'm going to say, read it again. Slaves, obey your earthly masters, or us, obey our, you know, our, our uh, boss and our job, in every respect, not only when they're watching. Like those who are strictly ple people pleasers. We don't want to be people pleasers, right? But with a sincere heart, fearing the Lord. People pleasers. Now that brings a preacher of one of the biggest churches in America to my mind who has admitted in interviews that he feels he's not been called to preach about sin. I'm sorry. You can't, you can't give all the good news without the consequences if you don't follow God. You have to know both, right? His name is Joel Osteen. And this is not biblical to only preach half the truth. Sorry if you like this preacher, but a half truth can still be considered a lie. You know, the best lies are 99% truth. All it takes is that 1% to lead us astray. That's why I want to know the words, because we want to know if there's any, even a little bit of lie in there. We want to be able to recognize that. And God gives you that gift of discernment to see if there's a lie in something. Instead of just being deceived because it's mostly truth, right? Acts 20, 26, it says, in Acts 20, 26, it says, Wherefore I take you to record this day, that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God, not just the little parts you like, right? Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, that means all the church, over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the church of God. See, it's our job to feed with the complete truth, not a half truth. Which he has purchased with his own blood. Jesus paid for this truth with his blood, so we have no right to change it or to leave anything out. Because God gave his life. His only son for that truth. It says to feed the church and declare the full counsel of God in Acts right there. Not just the things we like, right? 
What would happen if you fed your children only candy every day? How healthy would they be, right? They would eventually get sick. The church would, will be malnourished and unhealthy as well, with only hearing things that they like in the Bible. Like telling people heaven awaits for all, and never ever mentioning hell or sin, right? The church will get sick. It won't be a healthy church. 2 Timothy 4.3, it says, For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. It says sound doctrine in some translations. That means teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. Like Joel Osteen. I don't mean to pick on him, but he's the first one that came to mind. Verse 23, Whatever you're doing, work at it with enthusiasm as to the Lord. And not for people, because you know that you'll receive your inheritance from the Lord as the reward. Serve the Lord Christ. For the one who does wrong will be paid for his wrong. And there are no exceptions. So we've all seen what God's kids are not supposed to be doing, right? And the things we should be doing if we are kids of the King. If you have not seen any change in yourself, or you'd like to see these wonderful changes in your life, God wants you to pray right now. God wants me to pray right now. God wants all of us to pray right now and make sure we know Him. Because as we see on the news, my prophecy update, things are culminating. Things are getting closer together. They say the birth pains of the, the pregnancy of Jesus coming back is like, likened to a pregnancy. As the birth pains get closer, more and more things happen on the earth. We, know it's, we don't know when, but we know it's closer. So we want to pray right now. If anyone wants to make sure they know they know that they know that they're going to be in heaven soon when Jesus comes back for his church. Pray with me now. Give you one more chance if you didn't pray earlier. Father God, thank you, Jesus. For, thank you, God, for sending your only son, Jesus, to die, to suffer being separated from you. That was the hardest part. And just suffering the, the, the crown of thorns stuck inches into his skull. Um, the, the, the stakes that were just nailed through his feet, through his hands. The spear that was shoved into his side. And just the agony that he went through for hours on that cross. And we thank you that you gave up your son to do that for us. I pray that people would accept this free to us but very expensive to God. This gift. This gift of immortal life through his son's death. And you resurrected your son the same as you'll resurrect us. And we thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. You didn't have to do it. You said, is there any other way? Let this come past? God said, no. There has to be... There has to be justice. There has to be payment for sin. And we thank you for paying for our sin so we can be all the family of God. And we want to give you a big hallelujah. Amen.